uh, Xn. Okay. If you prefer to have something, you can extend this by periodicity mode 1. And if you consider that this function is periodic mode 1, you need not put this again. OK? Good. So when I have this, this is clear. And so xn, xn is uniformly distributed mode 1 if and only if for any alpha beta with what you had uh, what was it zero less than alpha less or equal than beta less than one uh, for if we have one over n summation n up to n of one and uh, your set is the interval alpha beta of xn well, is equal to beta mi minus alpha. But this may beta minus alpha, you can int uh, consider it as the integral of the function. It is the, so this is integral from 0 to 1 of uh, 1 alpha beta of t dt. Now to see this, the, the way that you are going to uh, integral of uh, functions permit you to do a lot of things. Then you can look at a linear combination, for example, of those functions. So if you have any step function, that is to say a finite sum of, uh, of such function, if you have a step function, then it will be the same. So you, you can say in some way for the time being where we are. Okay, I think this I can also remove. I just keep where we were. Just keep where we were. So now you understand how it is. You are going to say Xn is uniformly distributed mod 1 if and only if we have something like that for all step functions. Now something which is even larger than step functions are the functions which are Riemann integrable. Of course, you understand well that if you, if you use something which is Lebesgue integration, it will not work. It will not work because you can have a mass which is concentrated in one point or thing like that, and this will be terrible. But for Riemann integrable function, it should be true that you have something like that. And uh, also, if you consider only continuous function, it should be fine. And even when you are at continuous function, you have something which is Weierstrass, which will tell you that if you just consider your function e of h x, it will be enough because this is dense in 0, 1. And so I can state now the Welch criterion, and we'll say a few words about the proof theorem. So this is Hermann Weil. 1916, and uh, this is called the Weyl's criterion. Is the following a sequence of real number numbers xn is uniformly distributed mod one if and only if 1 of the two following equivalent conditions hold. One of the two.
following conditions. Holds first. So limit when n tends to infinity of one over n, the mean value of summation of n less than n of f of x n is integral from zero to one of f of t dt. For all, for any, for all functions, f, which are Riemann integrable, over zero one. You may put it closed, there is no problem about that. And the second one, the second one is that for any h, which is a positive integer, then the limit n tends to infinity of 1 over n, uh, summation, n up to capital N of e to the 2 pi i h x n. Then you don't have to put the fractional part because this is periodic with period 1. This is equal to the integral of this function. But if h is larger than 1, for the integral of this function, this is 0. So we'll give a, a quick proof of this. And of course, you can see from that, it is clear that uh, example the sequence n theta is dense modular 1, is uniformly distributed in modular 1. So you see it's much better than Kronecker's theorem, because you show that uh, that is dense. It was a bit later, hmm? 1016. Okay, why? Well, you take h, which is positive, and you try to see what is the summation when n is up to n of e of the 2 pi i. I mean, in the statement, I wrote it with the exponential of 2 pi i. But of course, in the, all the proofs and everything, I'm going to use the, 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 the smaller condition. E of, uh, so 2 pi i boop, does not exist, and so you have h n uh, theta. This is what you have to show, and you have to show that this is a little of, of capital N, or if you divide it by N, you have something which tends to zero, as you wish. Okay? Well, but this is very easy to, 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 show, to, to compute, because this is just a geometric progression. Exponential of H times something is the exponential of something to power H. And so this is the sum N up to N, or something which is exponential of h theta to power n. Okay? So this is, you know how you do it. Of course, one point which is very important is that the ratio here is the, is the ratio, the, the, the ratio the way you increase your, your thing. Is it equal to 1 or not? But this is not equal to 1, because if this were equal to 1, then h would be a, that theta would be a rational number. Okay? Is ud, of course, when theta is an irrational number. Otherwise, you know that it is not. It takes only finitely many values. It's very far from being uniformly distributed. Or You have to find another notion, because it's fine. So what is this? This is e of uh, how is it? H theta, this is the basis, 2 power n plus 1 minus 1 divided by E of H theta minus 1. 
Okay? I think this is correct. If you take x n plus 1 minus 1 divided by x minus 1, you get exactly the sum of the, of the business. And this is very nice because this is bounded. Okay? If you take this, this is at most 2 divided by 1 minus e of h theta. So it is even bounded, so if you, it, is, it is a little low of n. Okay? If you divide by n everything, you have something that tends, and tends indeed very quickly to, to zero. Fine. Uh, maybe just a remark, because I may forget it later on. This is very important also, because this is the way, one of the ways to compute integrals. If you want to compute integrals, what you do is to compute it through finite sum, but it is better to use this. It is shown that it is more efficient if you have a nice uniformly distributed sequence. It's better that to, I mean, to approximate it, if it is Riemann integral, you know how to approximate this integral by sums. This is the, the basis of, uh, of Riemann integration. But uh, it will be more efficient to compute a, a function like that, to compute an integral with, uh, with sums if your sequence here is well distributed. So well distributed we, we'll speak about later, but uh, this has practical uh, use. So maybe we go in, into, the, into to the, 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 the proof and uh, yeah, it's not very long. When did we start on time or a bit later? Almost, time, Almost on time. So I, I don't, uh, maybe I don't spend too much time on that. But right. No, I think it's fine. Here. Sorry? Yes, after, yes. Yes, what I, what I think. It was, it was a bit later here. Yeah. OK. So, uh, so uniform distribution implies 1. So this is the, the first point. We said that all that is equivalent to uniform distribution. So we proved that uniform distribution implies 1. 1 implies 2, 2 implies uniform distribution, and we have the, the three things which are, which are all equivalent, okay? So this is true, so this is what we want, it's okay for step functions. This is the way you call that, step functions, finite sum of a characteristic function of intervals, for step functions. Well. Now, if f is Riemann integrable, you can approximate it by step functions. Okay. So let since or since because it is assumed since f is Riemann integrable, there exist g1 and g2 step functions. Uh, such that with g1 less than f less than g2 and they are close as much as you wish it is not well written but I hope you understand what I mean and integral from 0 to 1 of g2 minus g1 is uh, less than epsilon Okay, if you prefer to write it fully with a g of a, g2 of x minus g1 of x dx, this is what, uh, what it means. I, I hope you, you can find that. Uh, for every epsilon positive. Okay? Well, now what it gives you, it, it will give you something which is lim soup. And you have lim soup of uh, 1 over n, uh, f of xn. 
the sum of the uh, the sum over n, little n, of the f of x n is at most the lim soup. Yeah, of one over n. Uh, some I don't know whether the limit exists for the time being. This is the problem. I know that it exists for step functions, but I don't know whether this exists. This limit exists, but the lim soup exists. There is no problem. So, and since f is always less uh, than g, this is clear that this is the lim soup of g of x n. Okay. But uh, now we know that this for this function the limit exists because it is a step function. And uh, for, a, for a step function, this exists. And this is just the limit of 1 over n of sum n up to n of g2 of, TD, uh, of g2 of uh, what, I, what, I, what I'm writing. I'm writing anything which is stupid. Uh, the limit, I know which is this limit. Don't write what I'm, what I'm doing here. This limit exists. And I know that this limit is the integral from 0 to 1 of g2 of t dt. OK, maybe I can stop here for this part. Because you will do it in the other way around, that the lim hinf will be larger than the integral of g1. And so the difference between the lip soup and the lim hinf will be at most epsilon. And if it is at most epsilon for any epsilon, it means that the lim soup is equal to the lim hinf, and so the limit exists. OK? And uh, so this is fine. Good, and the limit will be the, the difference between the will be in between those two limits, and will be the limit of f, and so on, because they are closed by on the L1 norm. Good. So now one implies two. This is the nicest place because you are just considering special case when the function are the e functions, e of h. Okay? So this is the special case. You say it is true for any Riemann integrable function. And from that, you have to say it is good also for the function which are continuous with us of Riemann integrable. And you compute the integral, and this is fine. And now what we have still to do is 2 implies i implies ud, sorry, which uh, of course it will imply also y, but I want to have everything to be equivalent. Implies uniform distribution, OK? So a first point is that in 2, we were considering only the function which are with h, which is positive, e of ht, when h is positive. Okay? Uh, but we would like to have it for all the h in z. Okay? So now if h, we, 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 we look at the following. 1 over n, summation over n up to 1 of e of h f, uh, not f, xn. Okay? So if n. We know that this tends to 0 if h is positive. Now what happens if h is negative, strictly negative? Then you are going to say this is minus. But everything is real here. And this is exponential of 2 pi i, so it's just conjugation. So this is just 1 over n, the sum over n of e to the h x n. And you conjugate each term, and so you conjugate the sum. And this tends to 0. Okay. Now there is one guy you didn't have yet. If the guy is 0, well, 1 over n, sum over n up to capital N of e of 0 times xn. OK? This is not too difficult to compute. All the terms here are equal to 1. And so this is equal to 1. This is equal to n, and this is equal to 1. So this is 1. And 1 is just the integral from 0 to 1 of e of 0 times t dt. Okay. By the way, the same thing will occur when you have positive, uh, when we have several variable 
functions. Be careful, this trick of considering only the positive one works only in dimension one. Don't forget, if you are in several dimensions, you will have to consider tuple of H's. Be careful, of course, the zero will be uh, beside, because this will lead you to the main term. But uh, the, the other ones, you, you cannot have it. Okay. Uh, so this is fine. So now, if you have this condition, the, the by criterion in some way, you have this for all these functions. Now this is nice because you want to, to, to do something like that and um, uh, well, so you can take <laughs> okay <coughs> So what do you know about this set of functions? Then you have to, I hope you have seen that, otherwise you, you look in the in textbook, what is called Weierstrass approximation theorem, okay? So if you take for any function, continuous function f in 0 1 let us say like that you can appro uh, better better not to, to make something stupid either you consider it as being continuously it's better to do uh, it's not good to write it like that with you, you have to do it with of that 0 is equal to f of 1, because otherwise it will not work. If you have any continuous function which, we, which you can prolongate in some way into a periodic function, uh, period 1, uh, then you can approximate it. Any continuous function can be approximated in the, how you call that, L infinity norm, in the soup norm, by uh, trigonometric polynomials. Okay? Be careful, you, you, cannot, you cannot approximate a step function. You will have to approximate a step function, but the step function, you cannot approximate it uh, by, uh, in the, in the uh, soup norm by, uh, by function which are continuous. Okay, the limit, the uniform limit of continuous function is continuous. So you have to be a bit careful about that, but this is enough for us. So we have it for any continuous function is approximated in the soup norm by trigonometric po polynomial. So this is Weierstrass theorem. Okay, and uh, and once you have all the continuous function, again you you are in the in the same business as before. Okay. And of course, since you have an, on a compact set, if, if you have something which is uniformly uh, approximated, it is also on the L1 norm approximated, it is even better. Because if everywhere the difference is at most epsilon, when you integrate it, you are on a set of length one, you have something which is also the difference uh, epsilon. Okay, so this, uh, so it's fine. And you see how efficient it is. Okay, we give the... Ah, now there is something interesting before moving to uh, van der Korput. There's something interesting. We gave already one, exa one application of that, that for the function n theta, it was very nice. What about n square theta? Uh -huh. Question. Is n square theta 
uniformly distribute in mode 1. If you even think whether it is dense, it is not that clear that it is dense. You see, there was something that linearity was absolutely crucial in Kronecker's proof. Here you don't have, you are losing the, this. So the idea of a uh, vial, Hermann Weil, it is also in his paper from uh, 1916. It's a very, very rich paper. <coughs> Hermann Weil is doing it also. And uh, I'll, I'll give something better later on. So I just want to explain you how he was dealing with that. Of course, always with theta, which is a rational number. Theta is a rational number. There is no way. OK. Weil's approach. In the next section, I, I'll give you something better. But the idea is the one I'm going to, to tell you here. So you are interested in the sum n up to n of e of n square h n square theta. By the way, h theta can be seen as being a theta itself. It is a different theta. So this, you, you are not really much interested in this h. If you know how to do for one h, you know how to do for the other one, because this is h theta. OK? Can you say something about this? Can you show that this is small? And this is the idea of Weiss, is to do the following. You square this, and you expand. So to expand, it means to make the product by the conjugate. So this is the sum of n. Think that n is always be n. Of e of n square theta. And if you want to make the conjugate, you will say that this is the sum over m of e of minus m square theta. OK? This is the product of the sum by its conjugate. Well, this you can say that this is the sum of n and m of e of n square minus m square theta. But n square minus m square, you can factorize it. It is n plus m and minus m. OK? So this is the sum n m e of n minus m, n plus m, theta. And now the trick is the following. You change the variable. Then, of course, you will have some difficulty, because here it's nice that n and m are working in the square. You take n here, you take m here. But now you, what you would like to do is to have something which is n minus m and n plus m. So you are working on something like that. So it's fine. Those are intervals, but the size will be a bit different. So it is more or less what you wish, but change the variables. What you are saying is that this is the sum over h of the sum over k. And there are k's in some interval, but the length depends, of course, of n. Basically, it will be something like n, except at the very edges. It will be something like n, but it will depend also on h. So k, h. If you, if you take one, one, of the, one of the two, it has no importance. It's something which is around n. 
or 2n or whatever, or minus n to, to capital N. This is something which is about n, and k is something which is about n. It will depend on h. But then you have something which will be E of h k theta. Maybe it was not good to write it. I should have write, written k h theta. Okay? And now this, you simply write that this is less than the sum over h, and this is the sum over k, and you are happy because now when, k, when h is fixed, this is exactly the sum you had before. Okay? So with this approach, what, what I do is something which is a bit clumsy, because you will have a denominator which depends on the approximation on h, and if you want to show that really it doesn't matter much, you have to, to work a bit more. So instead of working in this precise example, I will show in something more general. But this is definitely the trick that was introduced by, uh, by Weil. So this was in 1916, and then there is another guy, Van der Korput, who worked a lot on all these things uh, around uh, 1920. And uh, we are going now to, to use, so this, uh, I mean, th this is not really clean. It's just to give you the ID. It's not to give you a proof. Okay? Uh, and so now we, we move to uh, Van der Korput difference theorem. I think I can stop here with that. So the title of the uh, sections are, are not exactly the one, uh, the one I gave you, uh, but uh, this is easy to change. Okay? By the way, what I, what I think would be a good point is, um, you see, we have the, the record. This is one thing, which is fine. But if you say to someone, here is the record, then you have to go from exactly the beginning to the end to understand what is going on. What I, what I would like to do is to, 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 to take this and to say, well, this section, in this section, it is concerned with this and this result, and it is between this minute and this minute to make it uh, useful. You see? It's not to rewrite everything, there is no point. I mean, there are a lot of people who have written that in much better way than I am doing. So it's not to write everything, but to say if you want to know something about this result, this result is given between this minute and this minute. Okay? If you see what I mean. No. No, then. Then. You have some, you have, uh, I don't know, uh, six, seven pages telling you here is the plan of the course with the details, the statements, and to say if you want the statements, this part, section, it will be between this minute and this minute because otherwise you have to go yourself in the, it's a complete mess. So I think it's useful to have recorded it, but then we have also to have a good way to use it. Okay? Sorry? Yeah, I, th I, th I think this is, this is the way it is useful. I noticed that because this is what I did for the, the course I gave on um, these automatic sequences, if you remember. Yes. Uh, to know where, what did I prove exactly, uh, where was it, it's, uh, it's not that easy. And I, I, th I use my notes to know where it is. So. Okay, I'll start with the veil van der Korput inequality, and uh, and then we have some time to stop for a, for a little break. So, section three is van der Korput different theorem. So I start with the lemma, which is the veil, vile, monocoput, inequality. Uh, 
I just uh, the the idea I was telling, but uh, a bit better written. So let u1, un be a sequence, a finite sequence. Of course, it can it will be. When you use it, it will be something that exponential of 2 pi i xn with the first values. But uh, be a sequence, so a finite sequence, if you will, of complex number. And each some integer between 1 and n. So we have this inequality. Uh, why do I write it? Yeah, I write it here. It's better to have it here. H square uh, summation n up, up to capital N of un square. You see, it really looks like the, the, the sum we are interested in with the coefficient which are exponential of h x, uh, xn. This is what, uh, what we are interested in. And this will be h. I write it in detail, and then I will tell you what you have to think of it. In some way, it's easier if you want to prove something. If the statement is precise, it is, it is better than if the statement is not precise. And if you want to apply it, it may be better to have something which is maybe weaker, but easier to use. Sum of n, 1 to capital N of u n square plus 2 n plus h minus 1 and summation h 1 to h ah yeah be careful uh, h minus little h and you have the real part of summation n from 1 to n minus h of un, un plus h bar. The, the flavor is about the, the flavor that, uh, that we had with, uh, with Weil, you see? Well, where did I want you to, to make the... OK. So this is, this is the statement. So what, what do you get? You get something that in some way there will be some Cauchy somewhere. And when you have Cauchy, you always lose, lose the diagonal. Don't expect more than the diagonal. You may have things on the, OK. So this is the diagonal you will get. So if you have something which is 1 everywhere here, so the trivial bound is h square n square. This is the trivial. I assume that they are of modulus 1, which is for our application. We know that uh, there will be a complex number with modulus 1. So trivial bound is h square n square. Here you have something which is h. This is n. Forget about the n plus h, because h, h is something of the order n. So this is definitely of the order n. And this will be n. So this will be h n square. So OK, we, you have one something, which is 1 h. On the, on the trivial bound here. And now what happens if here, so this is the diagonal terms. And here, if you have no cancellation here, if you have no cancellation in this term, then you will get something which will be n, h. And this will be, again, you are summing on h. It gives you another h. And if you do something trivial here, it will give you n. So in some way, you have lost nothing. You have simply one something is the possibility that there is some cancellation here, which was exactly what we had in the, for the um, n squared theta. You see? So we have some possibility to win something. Now, to win something on the sum here, don't really expect something like that. 
essentially you will be back to that and it means if you know how to get some cancellation here when the on the sum over h it means essentially that you you don't need the sum over h and you you know how to do something here but be careful because it may happen that this depends on another parameter and you are summing on the parameter and then it may be fine to use it like that so this is good to have this statement but if you have no extra summing over some other parameter another way to use this and the way you are going to use it is the following so it's some corollary trivial corollary in some way but this is fine it will be h square sum over n 1 to n of un square so this is the left hand side is big O and you, you can put the constant which should be something like 4 or something like that then what you are going to do is to say I don't care about this n this is at most 2n so this is hn summation of un square usually this is easy to get but you, are, you know that you are going to lose something plus the 2 you don't care much about the 2 this is an n now you are going in this sum since you don't expect cancellation in H this would be but if you if you if you want to have cancellation keep that of course but what you can do is to put absolute value and once you have put absolute value here you can this term you can take it out get an upper bound with H so we get something which is N H hn since I wrote hn and then I simply have the sum h1 to h and then I have the sum n1 to n minus h of un un plus h bar So, for example, if you want to use it for the sequence n squared theta to show that n squared theta is well distributed, is uniformly distributed modulo 1, this will be enough for you. Okay? Good. So, uh, fine. Simply be careful. Each time you are replacing something by an absolute value, think. Uh, will I regret that sometime? I would like to f to wonder whether it makes sense to give the proof or not, because this is not really interesting thing. Yeah, I think I'll well. This is basic. You find that in all the, all the all the books you wish. So I don't think there is there is a point to to expand. You see, ah, the the the, the starting point will. Yeah, I, I give you the starting point, but I don't write all the all the details. You see, as you are going to to expand and to say this will go out of this. You see, as I was drawing, you see the 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 the, the square. Uh, which will be, by the way, not a square but a rectangle, but you want to go out of the rectangle, so what you say is that you prolongate the value of un by zero if n is smaller than, uh, than one or if n, little n is larger than capital N. Okay? And then you don't have to, you, you are summing in, indeed here from minus infinity to infinity, uh, it is much, uh, much more convenient. Part of the proof. Define un to be zero if n is less than one or n is larger than capital N. So I don't. Uh, I am not. You see, worried about the ranges. 
at the very end we, we are going to put it it's better to have a statement where you don't have this otherwise you can hear go from n is equal to 1 to capital N but uh, this is not very nice okay so now what you are doing is the following if you are looking at this sum when you are multiplying this sum taking it each time instead of repeating it you are going to shift it each time you see so this is the sum when h uh, is equal from 0 to h minus 1 example, of summation n all the n n in z of un plus h You see? You are just shifting them. This is important. You don't repeat the same sequence. Of course, each time h is given to you, you know what it means for n. What will be the value for n? OK? And now what you do here, then you Cauchy. OK? This is the verb to Cauchy. Albert Stamu said one, once, he, he was using that and he was saying, well, I didn't know that Cauchy was a verb. It is a verb. Okay. And I think now you, when, when you are done with that, it's okay. You know what it is. You're Cauchying that, so you have this sum over H. And there will be, of course, this is 1 times this. When you are summing the 1, well, it gives you the, 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 the one, it will give you this term. It will give you some summation of 1 up to h. It will give you the, the h back. And then you have this square. OK? And then you expand the square. And, uh, OK? Blah, blah, blah. And this is why you lose something, because here you are coaching. Don't expect more than to win h. So okay, maybe we can stop, have a little break here, and uh, this is what I got for difference. Okay, again, let's extend. Be a sequence. Of real number, Z. if for every positive H integral number, of course, the sequence. xn minus xn plus h is uniformly distributed mod 1, then the sequence xn itself is uniformly distributed mod 1. OK, so the proof. You let m positive integers, and you are trying to compute 1 over n, sigma n from 1 to capital N, of E of m xn. And what you expect is that this sequence, when n is tending to infinity, this is tending to 0. And if you can get that, then it's fine. Your sequence, by Weil's criterion, your sequence is OK. Good. So what you do is you apply the weil van der Kopput inequality. And what you say that this is big O of 1 over h. So you use this. Now, <coughs> those un have absolute value 1. So I have divided by n here. 
Okay, so there will be uh, 1 over xn, 1 over n square everywhere here. Okay? And, uh, okay, and there is no h square, so I am dividing also by h square. So everywhere I am dividing, if I put a 1 over n there, I divide everything by h n. I should have said first that uh, I fix n. I fix h. h positive number. Okay? Let that end, but essentially it will be fixed and n will tend to infinity. <coughs> so I, this is a modulus 1. So this is n, this h n square, and I divide by h square n square. Okay, h square from here and n square from here. So I have something which is 1 over h. So h is, is fixed. But of course we see that when h is turning to infinity, this is not a bad guy. 1 over h plus. Uh, now we have to see what we have. And uh, there will be something which is what? Uh, did I put it? Yeah. yeah. I think this is fine. Uh, plus. Uh, uh, so I have here hn and I divide by uh, h square n square. Okay? So I have something which will be 1 over nh. Okay, 1 over n h. Summation h is from 0 to h minus 1 or something which will be 1 over n. So 1 over n or 1 over n minus h, this is the same thing. You don't care much because h is fixed, little h is fixed. So everything, if you have something, it will go into a different constant here. Sum of a n, 1 to, yeah, n up to n minus h. And this will be E of M. So this is the E of M X. And then you have something which will be X N plus H E of M. X N minus X N plus H. Okay, just check that you, uh, to check that everything is fine, you say what if it is trivial? If it is trivial, I should get something like 1, because uh, this is the... So it is n, h, and if you have 1 over n and n, this is okay, it gives you something which is fine, and then you have... No, something is wrong here. Yeah. h. Sorry? It's something like 1 over n. Uh, you see here I have something which is uh, 1 over... I divide everything, so here I should write 1 over nh, which is here. Uh, yes, something is, something is not okay. This n, I have to put it here. Yeah, you're right, thank you. You, you can trick. It's nicer to write it n minus h, but uh, since n is tending to, to infinity, you don't care much about that. Thank you. Yeah, this is the sum over h, and this is the sum over n, and uh, this gives you 1 if you have no cancellation. But now you know something, that um, the lim soup of uh, this, when n is tending to infinity, uh, let n tends to infinity, the lim soup, what you get is that the lim soup of uh, this summation, 1 over n, Summation n one to uh, m n e of m x n square. Now, if you let n tends to infinity, I don't know whether this limit exists for the time being. But in any case, I know that if n tends to zero, this will tend to 
this will tend to zero because xn minus xn plus h is uniformly distributed on one. You see, for any positive h, uh, there is something which is wrong here. Why is it wrong? It should be h is equal to one. The h is equal to zero is just the diagonal, and it's here. This h is equal to one here. Sorry. Maybe one to capital H. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, this, when n tends to 0, then to infinity, this tends to 0. m is fixed, h, h, little h, is fixed. You see, m is positive, and h is fixed. So if you know that this sequence is uniformly distributed mod 1, you use, uh, you use well in the easy sense. This tends to 0. So the, this is the limit soup is at most capital H. Okay? And now you let this does not depend on H at all. Okay? So you may let H tend to zero, and you have that this limit is equal to zero. It is positive if you know the limit soup is zero, and the limit is zero. Okay? And let H. tends to infinity, and you have, by Weyl's criterion, you know that your sequence Xn is uniformly distributed in mod 1. Of course, there is no reciprocal in that. If you think of the sequence n theta, for example, <coughs> n theta minus n plus h theta is h theta, and this sequence doesn't, is not uniformly distributed in mod 1. Although the, so it doesn't go that way. But it's very interesting because now using that, it's easier to get what, uh, what I was not doing really very properly to show that n square theta is tending, is uh, uniformly distributed. So example, n square theta is ud1. Okay. Theta is irrational. What you do is just <coughs> to make this difference, and the difference, if you look at what is n plus h square theta minus n square theta, this is simply something which is 2hn theta uh, plus h square theta. Okay, so this is uniformly distributed mod 1. And you are shifting this by something which is constant. It doesn't depend on n. So you are just shifting. And if it is well distributed, you see it is just the measure uh, is invariant by uh, by rotation. Okay, so it's fine. So this is also uniformly distributed mod one. Sorry. Yeah. Using exactly the same trick. No, 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 no,
Good. good. And it's a very good book. Okay. Nicaraguas and Harald Niederreiter. I think it is something like uniform distribution mode one to the title. Okay? There are a lot of things in that. Okay. So we move now to something which is in some way, you see, we, we looked at, uh, at the, uh, uh, how to say, yeah, the, the, the difference between the number of elements in, a, in an interval, falling in an interval, and what you expect, okay? So this was for a given, each time for a given interval. Now we may try to find out something which will give you uh, how, how you can compute it because you see all that so uh, let me say it this is not in some way very effective each time you say it tends to infinity fine but you know that it may tend to infinity not, not, not those sequences but the, 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 the approximation may be good or not how can we find it in some way what we would like to have is a valid criterion which is effective not saying everything tends to zero, but if you know that the trigonometric sum, we have some good bound for trigonometric sum, can we get some good bound for the difference between the number of elements in, in an interval and the expected number? Okay, so what we want to have is something now which is effective. So the notion for that is called discrepancy. So this is the fourth section, which is discrepancy. So, okay, as usual, we have Xn, a sequence of real numbers. So what we consider the quantity dn, uh, be careful, dn of the, of the sequence xn, I, I tell you what I want to say. There are two ways to look at that. One way is to look at the number of elements in an interval minus the expected number. This is fine if you have something which is finite. If you are going to tend to infinity, it's better to think of frequency. Since I am more thinking of what happens when you have a full sequence and not only a finite sequence, I am more on the sides of the frequency. And both things exist in the literature. You simply have to understand what people are defining. I will define it as a frequency. Let me tell you. So, so what we do is to take the supremum when alpha less than beta less than 1. It can be with equality or not. This is not the problem. Of A of alpha beta n. Of course, it is for this sequence. I don't repeat it. Over n. This is the frequency. Minus beta minus alpha. I take the soup of all this difference. I know that if the sequence is going to tend to zero, then each term here will tend to zero when n tends to infinity. This is the uniform distribution mode one, and I'm trying to look at the supremum of that. Supremum can be just one. <coughs> so be careful, some consider n the n. That is to say the number of elements. But you, you will see uh, immediately whether you are considering dn or ndn. There is no, 
No reason. That, uh, I explain you why people have different things. So okay, uh, uh, we consider uh, this is called. The discrepancy of the sequence Xn. Okay? Now there is something interesting is that if your sequence is uniformly distributed in mode 1, then all those things will be small. But what's interesting is that the soup will be small also. So the sequence Xn there's something uniform here is uniformly distributed in mode 1 if and only if limit when n tends to infinity of dn of xn is equal to 0. So there, there is something uniform in that. Of course, in what direction is just trivial. If this limit is equal to 0, then if the soup is tending to zero, each for each alpha beta it will tend to 0, because the soup is tending to 0. What is, what is not obvious is that it works also the other way around. Okay? So maybe I give some proof of that because it may be a bit surprising. It's not difficult, it's a capacity in some way question. So, okay, we assume that Xn is uniformly distributed in mod 1. And we want to show this that the discrepancy tends to 0. Okay, so you consider an integer m. Of course, as you understand, it will tend to 0. And uh, you consider the intervals i k, which is k over m, k plus 1 over m, for k in 0, m minus 1. I'm just cutting. You see everything like that. And now let, let n0, there exists some n0, depending on m. and 0 depending on n such that for n larger than n0 for any n larger than n0 of m and every k and any k we have so a of i k n the number of elements which fall into up to n, which fall into this interval, divided by n, it is something which has the size, the length of this interval is 1 over m, so it should be something like 1 over m. And uh, since you have only finitely many of them, and each is tending to 1 over m, so the supremum is tending to, uh, to 1 over m, this is only finitely many terms. So what I can say that this is something which is between 1 over m, 1 plus 1 over m, put any, uh, anything you wish, I mean here. It need not be the same m, but uh, it makes it convenient because at the very end you say when m tends to 0 and you are happy. No, there's no point to, to add other things. So 1 over m, 1 minus 1 over m. Okay, this is just because for each Okay, the limit is 1 over m, and uh, you have only finitely many of them, and so you are happy with that. Okay. Now let you consider an interval j. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, and what we want to see is to, to say that the discrepancy is here. So we take an interval j and we want to say something about this, this term. So let j, which is alpha beta in 0, 1. Closed or not closed, uh, this one is open, there is no, no difference. So, okay, you can find two finite union of IK. Say J1 and J2, such that J is between J1 and J2. You see, you have some interval here, so you have a little grid like that. This is the e IK. Now you take some interval like that. You see that there is one which contains and what it doesn't contain, and they are rather close one to the other, of course. Okay. So you have this, and if you look at lambda, the this is the uh, Lebesgue measure, the length, the length of J minus the length of J1 is at most 2 over M. You, you may have here something which, which is almost 1M and this is also almost one, 1 over M, but not more. Otherwise, you take a larger one. And, uh, and similarly, lambda of J2, the larger one, the larger one minus lambda of J is also less than 2 over m. Okay? So you're happy with those guys. Now you simply have to make some little computation. I hope I can do something with here. Okay, so now when m, n is larger than n naught, what happens? You have aj1. So aj of n over n. This is less than aj2 with the larger n over n. And you know that this is at most lambda j2, uh, 1 plus 1 over m. And uh, then, because of each, J2 consists only of uh, N. And for any subinterval, you have this. OK, you, you lose a factor at most 1 over M. Fine. And uh, of course, you have the same thing, blah, 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 with J1. OK? Good. Now, if you look at AJ of N, over n, this will be something like lambda j plus 2 over m, 1 plus 1 over m. This is because lambda j2 is less than this. It's just an in inequality we had. You have a good approximation of your interval j by j1 and j2. And in the same way, there you will get something which is lambda of j. Uh, plus minus 2 over m, 1 minus 1 over m. So essentially what you see is that I'm not going to, oh yeah, I'm going to write it. And, uh, rather than better, I wanted to, to say this, but uh, okay. Okay, so now what you have essentially is what is important, the main term here is lambda j times 1. Here the main term is lambda j times 1. And in all the other terms you have at least a 1 over m in factor. This is 1 over m times this, but this is at most 1, this length. So this is really bounded by 1 over m, and uh, this one is bounded by 2 over m, and uh, this one is almost peanut, it is something over m square. So each one will be, if you take the difference, that a 
g n over n, you find that this will be minus lambda j. You have a du double inequality, I just put it like that. And then you have something which will be at most something 4 over m or whatever you wish. Okay? You have something tending to 0 with m. And so you're happy with that. I think this is fine. And uh, so now you have this, and this is true for all m. Okay? And so when m, now there is no m in this inequality. This inequality is always true. Okay, so if n is so, of course you have the dependence of n. Yeah, this depends on n because it has to be sufficiently large in terms of m. But you can have this, which is uh, if if you take some epsilon, you are you are given some epsilon. You say okay for n sufficiently large, this will be true, and this will be true for all j. J does not depend on m. J has been given a priori. The only thing that depends on m is n. Okay, so you have something uniform, and so the discrepancy is tending to zero. Okay. Ah, now we have something here which is quite important: is the explicit dependence between the discrepancy and the value of trigonometric sums. So. Possibly I write something, and uh, then I will explain you. I am not going to, to write the, the, the proof. The proof are well given, by the way, in the, the book I mentioned of a Montgomery. Th what I am saying here in the, in the Erdős-Turán inequality, what I am saying is not in the uh, Kuipers and in the Reiter. And this is, this is really a sort of, I regret it is not there, because it is very efficient. In some cases, it is really needed. <coughs> so, next one is Erdős-Turán. So, this is not a double dot. This is double uh, acute accent. In Hungarian, you have different things. You have the sound O and the sound e with two dots. But sounds exist as short one or long one. O, O, E, E. And when you have a long one, you add this one. For example, Vera Shosh, mathematician Vera Shosh, you have a long O with acute accent. And then, if you want to make the acute accent out of that, you make this. And if you want to do it in tech, then there is one way to do it in tech. You put backslash H, o, H for Hungarian. And the output will be that. And Erdős is a long E, uh, like sure, beer. Okay. And to run, again, is an acute accent. So, okay, Erdős to run inequality. Forty-six or so. So, this is an effective version. of uh, Vail's criterion, Vail's criterion. Uh, maybe before writing it, I write something which is a discrepancy with respect to the length of intervals. So let lambda in zero one. Whoop, maybe I can put it even except the value one. This is not that bad. We define uh, 
the discrepancy dn of lambda xn or sequence n is the supremum over uh, all intervals i which are in 0, 1. Oh, maybe I write it with alpha, beta, it's easier. Alpha, beta, less than 1, or that's equal to 1, of uh, A and beta minus alpha equal lambda. I am looking at all the intervals of a given length lambda. I'm looking at the discrepancy, but not over all the intervals, just the one with length lambda. I tell you why it is important to have this. Of A of uh, your sequence Xn, uh, which fall into uh, How do, was I writing that? Alpha beta, maybe alpha beta n over n minus beta minus alpha. So this is the discrepancy, but the discrepancy only for one interval. This you don't find in a, in a Kuiper's and the writer, but you find it in the Montgomery lectures. So now I have this notion, let me write what it is. Theorem. Need the others to run inequality. Let Xn be a sequence of real numbers as usual, and lambda in 0, 1 for any positive k one has, we have, as you like, dn of lambda xn is less than 1 over k plus 1 plus 2 summation k from 1 to capital K of 1 over k plus 1 plus minimum of lambda and 1 over pi k it may be a bit long but And then you have the trigonometric sum, by the way. The mean value of the trigonometric sum, 1 over n. Summation n from 1 to a, capital N of E to the k xn. So we have to understand what it means. Sorry? Uh, yes, maybe. This is this coefficient. Yes, this is the coefficient. So we have to understand what it means. You see, what you would do is the following. Let us assume that the world is rather nice. You have an interval of length lambda and you want to know how many terms are here. So what you do is you make some expansion 
of that, or some approximation of this interval, and by the way, this would be the, the proof. We make some approximation of this interval with a, tr a polynomial, trigonometric polynomial of length k. So this is, you have a polynomial, which is a good polynomial, and maybe you have two of them, one which will be below, one which will be, ab you see, above the other one, which will be below. So those are two polynomial, trigonometric polynomial of length k, of length k. Trigonometric polynomial means that you have something which will be a uh, summation of e to the k uh, x t, if you want, and with a coefficient one above, one below. Okay? And now what you say is that if I want to count the number of elements which, is, which are here, I just count the sum of this, because this is essentially the indicator function of my interval. Good. Now it will not be exactly that, of course. This function is not, it's just an approximation. So we'll, there will be some error term somewhere. You may expect that when k is large enough, the difference will not be too too bad. You are not going to, well, this is this. This is what you, that you are going to lose. You are going to lose something and you find it here. This is just because approximation of length k will not work completely, okay? Now you want to say something about this. This is, first of all, you have something with 1 over k. Why is it something like 1 over k? Try to find the Fourier coefficient. By the way, you can find, even if you have an indicator function, you can find its Fourier coefficient. It doesn't mean that the convergence, of course, will not be uniform, because otherwise you would have the indicator function, which is continuous. This doesn't work. But you have, in different ways, a convergence to, to this. So you look at the Fourier expansion, and if you look at the Fourier expansion, the coefficient are something with 1 over k. Okay? This is why you have something which is 1 over k here. This is just because you are taking the Fourier expansion of an interval, and this is what you would get. Of course, it would go further, but the fact to break at k, this is responsible for that. Now there is something which is quite interesting, which you don't see usually, it's not given, and it's very important if you have a very small in, in, interval. It's this lambda. Why this lambda? Well, this lambda is because if you are looking at the Fourier coefficient, you just integrate, and you know that the Fourier coefficient would be something it is supported by an interval of length lambda, so the Fourier integral will not be more than lambda. You see, you, you do the Fourier inverse. So to get this, you multiply by e to the minus kt, and you integrate from 0 to 1, which is to say that you, inter you integrate indeed between alpha and beta. So this is responsible for that. No, for that. Okay? So you, you cannot expect to do really much better than that. Okay? So the point is, and this is well done, in, uh, <coughs> this is due to Valer. The fact to find, to find good trigonometric polynomials which permit to do that. So it's a bit messy to write, but if you know what you are going to do, it's fine. You have, I think, two, three pages of, of computation, but it's okay. It's very well done in the Montgomery paper. Now, usually, the way it is done is the following. Since this is the minimum, just stick to this one. Take 1 over k. Since k is less than capital K, you are not, it's not interesting to put 1 over capital K. So usually what you get as a corollary, and this is what you will find usually, is that dn of xn is at most, and the constant you can, can be absolutely explicit from that already. Maybe not the best one, but the, from here you get explicit constant. It will be something which is 1 over k 
plus summation k is equal to 1 to capital K to 1 over k. And then you have the summation 1 over n, the summation of e to the kxn. Usually it's presented like that. But if your interval is very small, is pretty small, it's good to have this because for the first value of k, you really win something. <coughs> so I think I gave you in some way the, 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 the way why, how, it should, uh, how this should be done, okay? Let's find a good approximation, trigonometric polynomial of length k, and uh, you can find it in such a way that it is good enough to produce that. Okay. Now, uh, just one thing I will mention like that, is that you may have also sequences in, not only in one dimension, but also uh, sequences with value in R2, and then you are looking also how the different component can be modulo 1. And you have the same thing, and uh, you have Fourier in, in, in several di dimensions, and everything works in the same way. And you have nice extension, and the extension of Erdős-Turán are due to essentially Coxma, and Schuss also. Z, yeah. Coxma and Sus. It was about at the same time. I think Coxma is better because it gives you also some very good expansion of this under this form of the Erdős Turán expansion. I think that in the in the course, in the main course, we will use that several times this Erdős Turán. Not always in this delicate form, also in this form. Okay. Sorry? Oh, uh, yeah, several, uh, several dimensions. Inequalities. Inequality in several dimensions. This is curious because you see, if you put a S in the Hungarian, it's a SH, Vera Shosh, Erdős. If you want to make the sound S, you write SZ. And SZ is SH for a Polish guy, and so here Henrik, Henrik is, imp it is impossible for him to say list. The companist. It's always list. The list you write it L E S S Z T. Okay. <coughs> Good. So, well, what uh, what remains now is to say a few words about trigonometric sums. What you are doing with trigonometric sums, because up to now we have only considered the case of a trigonometric sum, which is an, uh, uh, a ge geometric progression. So trigonometry sums. I 
Ah, and here is a um, reference I should have put really, which is very important for that. It's uh, seed gram. and Gregory Kolesnik. Which is called Van der Koppert method. Of exponential sums. It's very complete. So it is London Matsock lecture note series. And it is the volumes 126, it was in 1991. Gram. J R A H A M. Okay, so one has a bit to, to understand how things are going on and possibly I start uh, by telling you what are, uh, a few things. So essentially what you would like to say is try to imagine how we treat our summation over n. I don't make precise the range for n, you'll understand why of E of something which is n to the alpha or theta n to the alpha if you wish. Let us say n to the alpha. Uh, yeah, I put a theta so that because if alpha is an integer then uh, you may be in difficulty because it may be just stupid. So I put some theta. But essentially it is on alpha that I want to, to, to discuss that for different values. So what happens, you have three, in some way, three, three aspects to understand. The first one, that if alpha is small, then uh, n alpha, e to the n alpha, small that is to say less than one, take square root of n, okay? If alpha, It's okay? Okay. So if alpha is small, E of n alpha uh, doesn't turn too much, you see. It doesn't go too, too quickly around. Okay? So you, 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 may, you may handle it in some way easily. So too much is too small. Doesn't turn too much. I will give you a precise statement then. Turn too much. And you have a good control. One has a good control. And this is called Kuzmin Landau. Okay. Now, if alpha is larger, then when you differentiate, basically, and this is good for almost all kind of function, when you differentiate your, say you have your function at about x, if it is something like x alpha, when you differentiate it, you will get something like x alpha minus 1. Okay? So usually, you have the following, that d over dt of t to the alpha is something which is of the order, I don't care about the constant, I want to, to insist on the fact that this is not interesting, this is t to the alpha minus 1. Ah, then you know exactly what you are doing. Well, you lose van der Koppert inequality. You see, you are diff taking xn plus 1 minus xn is really taking a differential. You remember what we were saying about uh, at the very beginning with this uh, 
partial derivative or a partial summation. Definitely, this is a discrete differentiation, but it is a differentiation. So, von der Korput is fine for that. Aha. So then you use van der Korput, and you use van der Korput again and again and again until you fall into the hand of Kuzmin Landau. Of course, you know that each time you differentiate, you are going to use Cauchy and you are going to lose something. So if alpha is very large, don't expect to have something which is very good. Because you are losing something in the, in the differentiation. Okay? Now there is something you have to understand that this is fine, but if you are uh, looking at that thing, this, this, is, this is nothing, this is quite, uh, quite easy, but <coughs> if you are looking at the sum like that, one to one to e to the n, n alpha, you don't have a good control on the derivative. Because I said the derivative, this is if you are about at the v value t, this is fine. You would like something to be controlled, to have something which is only with constant. But here, the derivative is between 1 and n to the alpha minus 1. This is very bad. So usually what you do is simple. You make some dyadic dichotomy. Okay. Eric, how you say? Dichotomy? Dichotomy is when you cut into two parts. If you cut into several parts, you say? I, uh, let me use dichotomy. That is to say you have n, then you say I use n over 2, then I use n over 4, then I use n over 8, and so on. And each time I have a good control on the derivative, this will be fine. Maybe you lose a logarithm, a logarithm in the business, but uh, because you have con to consider log n terms. But usually, you win. What you want to do is to win a constant uh, in the exponent, win something in the exponent. So log is nothing in your problem. So this is important. Don't, don't, don't try to use directly the the, 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 the statements which, which you find in uh, in uh, any good book. Okay. Now, sorry. It's okay. Uh, di dichotomy means c to cut in two two parts, and dyadic means to have things which are between x and two x for me. But a priori, dichotomy means cutting in two. So. Dyadic division. Yeah. Division. This, good. I didn't dare uh, using that because just the French word too. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, fine. So now I have just to present a few bounds for trigonometric sums. But definitely, uh, it's very good to have uh, chapter two of Graham and Kolesnik will give you really the. The, the, the statements you, you need, okay? and the proofs also. So first, the theorem of Kuzmin Landau. Okay, we suppose that f is a C1 function. Continuous with continuous derivative. You use this? No? Okay. Well, continuous with continuous derivative. Okay, C1 function. Uh, F prime is monotonic. F prime is monotonic. And F prime is larger than some lambda positive. 
either positive either or negative it cannot change sign you see because since it is continuous if you have positive and negative value it has to go to zero and this is forbidden <coughs> important so you assume that you have that on some interval i let us say then you have summation then the summation of n when n is belongs to this interval i of e of f of n is less than 2 over pi this is a 2 uh, pi lambda something is wrong lambda 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 is the lambda which is here it is the lower bound of the absolute value of the derivative. On, on that interval, is that yeah, on the on all the interval you have that, and so if you take the sum of all the integers in this interval, you get this upper bound. Let us take some example, if you wish. We take square root of n. So we prove that way that square root of n is equidistributed mod one. So, example, square root of n is ud1. So, of course, what you have to do is to, co to compute the, the term. But if you want to have something you understand for the derivative of square root of n, if you take on all the interval 1 to n, you have something which is very bad because here you will have just a constant. Uh, no, there's something which is wrong here. No, it's fine. No, no, the, this is fine. This is the distance to the nearest integer. No, no, this is fine. So you take it Consider, so you consider this sum only on an interval which is between n and 2n. So you want to say what is the sum n between n and 2n of e of the 2 pi i square root of n. If you multiply by h, you will get something, but uh, h is not really relevant in this business. If you want to do uniform distribution, you have to add some h. Let us say h, but I don't want to, to put it because it is then uniform in h, but what is interesting is to have this. So, okay, what you have to say is what is square root of n over this interval. So the derivative of square root of n, f of t is square root of t, and f prime of t should be 1 over 2 square root of t. No? This is fine. And so this is pretty small. So this is something which is of the order of magnitude, 1 over, squ one over square root of n. OK? So when you are looking at that, uh, this is the lambda. The lambda is 1 over square root of n. And then it tells you something like this is, at most, I don't care about the constant. I have also a constant here. But this is something which is n to 1 half. So you see, you have a good cancellation. You have something of length n. The trivial bound is capital N. And what you get is the upper bound, which is n to 1 half. So now, of course, what you are going to do, and I let you do that. It's a bit messy, but uh, this is not the real problem. You do it between n and n over 2. And then you'll get another time something like that, but uh, it's not that bad, and the length is, too, is not too long. And you put all them together, and you get still some bound, which is maybe into one half log n, or into one half times uh, pl plus epsilon, or something like that, but it, it will work. And as long as h is fixed, you will have the same thing. Then you have some h here, and this will work for any h, and so you have this. And even if you use Erdos to run, it will give you 
a good upper bound for the discrepancy because you have something which is explicit and which is not too bad okay okay <coughs> now what happens if you have something which is n to 3 over 2 well n to 3 over 2 well you go through a van der Koput and use van der Koput inequality and things like that and some people have been kind enough to produce us with the result of what it gives so if you want something very explicit you can go to um, to Graham and Kolesnik even in chapter 2 you will get things which are of course then there have been some uh, better better things but if you are just in, interested you see in winning something which is n which is 1 minus some constant whether it is small or not you don't care all that will be fine on the one of course you have to fight to get uh, to get something different I didn't speak about the three things I mentioned here that there's another one is that at some point you arrive at a sum where it is better to treat this sum by using Poisson summation formula and this was done also by van der Kalput and then you try to mix from time to time you take you, de you decrease the degree by van der Kalput and then you use Poisson summation formula it will give you something more but it's better than taking trivially the terms and so on and so on uh, all literature already the book of Graham and Kolesnik will give you a lot of things on that level so by the time I just give you one 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 statement and uh, is it here yeah Okay, so theorem, which is van der Korput. All that was in the early 20s, 1920s, or one century ago. So you let n less than 1, r less than n2, which are integers, and i be an interval in n plus 1 to n an interval you have a function f which is a function which is r times differentiable for i with real value okay and we assume we'll tell you what is this value in a, some example we assume that there exists that for some f which is which depends on i indeed usually it depends only on n it, not, it even does not depend on the on i it depends on n such that all well, that is such that we have the following for x in i for r little r in uh, 1 capital R what we assume is that we have f n to the minus r is function f auth derivative I put x better to put x here uh, f n minus r Uh, yeah, they are constant here. This is by constant. You have constant on one side and constant. So it is well uh, well understood how it is up to some constant. It is really any any function which is natural. You see, square root of n is fine. Maybe it doesn't go. Each time you differentiate, you are losing uh, n. This is quite uh, quite natural for all the all the nice function you you may meet. They satisfy this. This is true, for example, for all the functions uh, t to the alpha. Uh, 
or t to the alpha log t or a, a lot of function would satisfy this. When you differentiate, you just lose the size of the, of the interval. Okay? So this is just the, the only thing you need. And then you have an upper bound. Then summation n in i of f, e of f of n is big O of something which is n times. So n is a trivial bound. So you expect that you are going to win something. f to the u, but you have some negative power of n. This is fine. I tell you what are u and f. And the inverse of f, f minus 1, where u is 1 over 2 to the r minus 2 and v is r to the 2 to the r minus 2. So you see asymptotically the saving you have is something which is a power of r, 2 to the r, because each time you are using Cauchy, you are losing a square. And when you are losing, when you are Cauchying two times, you are losing the square of the square. And this is why you have a power of 2. This power of 2 is what you lose by using Cauchy. Okay. Fine, this is, a, this is something. Maybe I give some example and then we, we stop. Yep. Yes, it's monotonic, yes. Increasing or decreasing. Uh, then uh, this is zero. This is the distance to the nearest integer. Yeah, this is the distance to the nearest integer of the derivative, and this is on some interval, that is to say for all x in some interval, i you have f prime of x distance to the... Hmm? Yeah, this is my interval. This is my function. And the function, the derivative is always, is already less than 1. It's less than 1 half, so. There would be more than 1, isn't it? If I take f to be e power x, I'm taking, you take f of n to the e power n. e to the power n. Then why do you? f of n itself. is e power n. But this is, this is very large, and you are, but, but then it, it, it is not at all small. This has to be very small because you want it to be the distance to the nearest integer to be small. If, if f prime, if f, I mean, to say that the distance to the nearest integer is something like lambda, it means that it is between lambda and 1 half. So this is 1 half, this is lambda. So it is very small, so it has to be very small, it has to stay in a... What's the function you are taking? E power A, D. Yes. But E power T, when you take the derivative, the derivative will take the integer. Yes. So it will be one step away. Yes. So if you take the integer values, then the distance between that and the integer values... You are only looking at the value set. I, I didn't understand the meaning of uh, mod of x. The, the meaning of? Only, only at the actual point. Is the no. No. F prime is, this is a real number. This is a real number, and so I want to. No, 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 it is on, on some interval. That is to say, for all x in i, f prime. That is to say that once you have found that it was maybe smaller than, uh, than one half, it has to stay between one half and lambda. It can never go out of that. Maybe between my, here you have maybe 1 minus lambda, but it doesn't go out of this. This is forbidden. This is forbidden. Okay? 
Then it has to be, th this is why, for example, this function is nice, because this is pretty small. You see, it is about n to one minus one half. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. This is the distance to the nearest integer. No, no, it, it has to be really a small function. So this is where definitely the derivative is small, and so it turns out smally, slowly. This is some sort of second theorem of the, the second mean value theorem. This uh, Kuzmin Landau, if you prefer to say it like that. So try to see here what you get if you take, I don't know, x to the 5 over 2. I don't want to erase that because it was under discussion, so. So what you do is, for example, to choose r is equal to 3. So what, what is the value of f in this, uh, in this business? Well, first of all, for 0, you will have your function itself is something which is n to 0. And so f has to be something like n to 5 over 2. OK? This is fine, because if you take s is 5 over 2, f of 0, this is something like, uh, what I'm saying? Yes, r is equal to 0, so this is just 1, and so this is f. Now you see that when each time you differentiate, it will work, this. Because if you differentiate it, then when you differentiate once, you will get 1n down. So it's fine. So you can do that as much as you wish, up to infinity if you, if you want. OK? This will work very nice. So now you have to say what is u, what is v, and to see whether you win something when you take r is equal to 3. So what is u? u is 1 over, so 2 to the 3 minus 2 should be 6, no? u is 1 over 6, v is 1 over 2. 3 divided by 2 to the 3 minus 2, blah, blah, blah. This works. Then van der Koppel tells you that 1 over n, we have to write it like that, what I have, 1 really. Oh, I, I, I leave the n because it was, it was written like that. Of e to the 5 over 2 is smaller than n times. Now you have something which is f, f to the u. So this is 5 over 12, n to the 5 over 12. And then you have n to the minus v, and this is n to the minus 1 half, plus f, which is n to the minus, uh, what is uh, n? f is minus 5 over 2. OK, and you see that the point which is important here is that this is less than 1 half. So you are really winning something. You are winning something. This is 6 over 12. You are definitely winning 1 over 12. So this is less than n to the 1 minus 1 over 12. OK? And so n to the 5 over 2 is distributed. And moreover, if you go into Erdos-Turan, 
you are able to say, but of course, if you take some H, there will be some H, and then you will have to play with that. But Erdős-Turán will tell you that the discrepancy is something which is n to the 1 minus something. Okay, this is typically the, the type of thing we are going to, to use. So possibly you, you start with, uh, with the second derivative and uh, be, before using all that, you, you go, you go, I think uh, uh, Graham and, um, uh, and Kolesnik is quite good, chapter two, because you, you start with something which is Kuzmin Landau, and then you go to the, the fact that you have only one step to do in Van der Kopput inequality, to, uh, and then two steps, and then. Well, it's a, it's a bit messy, but uh, but it's fine. Okay, so I think we stop here for today.